Well, good evening, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Could I get a big good evening? Thank you very, very much. Good evening and welcome to a uh, wonderful evening ahead for all of us. Uh, if you'd be so kind to uh, take your seats, maybe uh, take a moment uh, or two to uh, say hello to a neighbor at your table so we all, most of us, know one another anyway. Uh, for those of you uh, who don't know me, uh, my name's Dan Ray. I do, uh, I do some television, or well, I did television for a long time. 31 years less five days, not that I was counting. And I now do radio on WBZ Radio, night side, from 8 to midnight, Monday through Friday. Hope that all of you get a chance to listen. Whether you agree or disagree, always appreciate your listenership. Very quickly, I, I just have to say, this is a very significant day uh, to me personally. Besides being here uh, to, um, amongst others, honor uh, my friend, the Chancellor, the best Chancellor in the United States of America, in my opinion. And anyone who, argue, who would argue with the fact that he's the best, we know he's the biggest, that's for sure, so you're not going to argue with him about being the best either. So I'll say a thank you very much for that. Um, uh, my last day in television was July 26, 2007, and I uh, am a proud graduate of Boston State College. That's my undergraduate. I am now a proud graduate, and I have been for many years, uh, since the merger of those two, uh, to this school and Boston State College, as a UMass Boston graduate. And I encourage all of my friends, all of my friends and former colleagues at UMass, uh, at Boston State College, to become really active here, because this is, a, this is a school that is on the move. There is no doubt about that. Those of you who have some familiarity with what's going on here, uh, with the Chancellor's plans, he's going to turn this uh, university campus into something like uh, 10 years from now we won't even recognize with the help of all of you. Uh, we have a dynamic leader uh, in J. Keith Motley, and I want you to know there's nobody from your neighborhood of Pittsburgh who uses the initial J or any initial. It's all Keith or whatever. But J. Keith Motley, um, who is our Chancellor, uh, and I, I really mean it. He's, the, he's, a, he's a great leader, okay? He's a great chancellor, but he's a great leader. I just wanted to mention very quickly that when I worked in television, I tried to do stories that helped people, and the signature story of my career was a story that involved getting four innocent men out of prison who had been convicted for murder they didn't commit. And my last day on television, Federal Judge Nancy Gerdner awarded these men and their families, two of whom had died in prison, Four men served 109 years in prison for a murder they didn't commit. They actually were framed by an FBI informant and by FBI agents. Anyway, um, this case has gone on for 42 years until yesterday. The Solicitor General of the United States government yesterday decided to drop all appeals and these four families will be compensated <laughs> for what happened to their loved ones. And I want to say this, if it hadn't been for Boston State College, I never uh, would have gone to college. And if I hadn't gone to college, I never would have become a lawyer, I never would have become a broadcaster. And I can't tell you how proud I am as a graduate of Boston State College to know that Boston State College played a role in my life, which in turn helped to play a positive role in the lives of other people. And yesterday, this nightmare for these families ended uh, they don't know much about Boston State College, but believe me, their, the education I received there uh, at Boston State College contributed to what um, I was able to accomplish on a little small basis just to make the world a little better place uh, than, it, than it was for these particular families. And that's what I think Boston State College and more importantly, University of Massachusetts at Boston is all about. Because tonight, we, were, we are going to um, dedicate this program uh, and you'll see the theme running throughout, Green Education for the Next Generation Celebration. Uh, I, uh, we're going to be honored to share the stage tonight uh, with two great graduates of the University of Massachusetts, Boston. 
uh, the United States Environmental Protection Agency Assistant Administrator for Ear and Radiation, Gina McCarthy, who is a 1976 graduate and will be our keynote speaker tonight. Just talking to Gina. She is in charge, she tells me, of the air and the climate. So that's good to know. We got the air and the climate covered. I also want you to be absolutely rest assured that the water in the glasses on your table are Poland Springs water. I'm sure some of you might have seen those flashing signs about boil the water, okay? Well, the good, the good news, the bad news is there was a big leak for, um, uh, for the MWRA system, but the good news is that's Poland spring water so you can enjoy every last drop and not worry about any problems later on this evening. Uh, we will have to tell you, though, out of an abundance of caution, there will be no coffee and tea served tonight, okay? So just uh, bear with us on that. That's the bad news. Uh, I also am very proud tonight to, um, uh, to share the stage with the retired University of Massachusetts, Boston, and Boston State College professor, uh, John Looney, Jack Looney. Uh, his uh, family uh, is synonymous with Boston State College. And it is, um, it is a great honor to be involved as your Master of Ceremonies tonight. Now, my first responsibility, of course, is to get the, meeting, the, get a, get the evening moving, and, and I will. I just want to explain to you that what we're doing tonight is we're supporting two great, um, I, I don't think call them charities, two great organizations. The Center for Sustainable Enterprise and Regional Competitiveness, Com Competitiveness CERC, and the J. Keith Motley Scholarship program. They will be the beneficiaries of this event. Now, the Center for, the Center for Sustainable Enterprise and Regional Competitiv Competitiveness, CERC, launched in 2009 and fosters the transition of a clean economy through research, education, and outreach. CERC provides green education for the next generation, kind of our theme for tonight, uh, for business leaders at the undergraduate, graduate, and certificate levels, giving them the leadership skills they will need to transform business practices and inform policy. And I'm sure that our keynote speaker will be addressing some of that tonight. Equally important, the J. Keith Motley Scholarship Program supports graduates of the university's pre-collegiate programs. How many universities and colleges have a pre-collegiate program? That's called thinking ahead, who go on to study here at UMass Boston. And the majority of the participants in this pre-collegiate program are from minority and low-income backgrounds and go on to be first-generation college students like many of you and like me, first-generation college graduate in my family. The scholarship fund was established in honor of Dr. Motley's inauguration as chancellor and pays tribute to the chancellor's impressive rise and his professional achievement from humble beginnings with the help of the University of Pittsburgh's Upward Bound program. So uh, Keith Motley is uh, paying it forward, as we say, giving back, as maybe older generations said, and we have two wonderful programs that will benefit tonight. Now, we've got a great program planned for tonight, uh, but before we get to food, if you want to start, go right ahead. I'd like to thank and recognize the event sponsors whose charitable support made this evening possible. By the way, by the way, on your table, and you can't take these with you, are a couple of digital frames, uh, and they will be kind of giving you a play-by-play -play as the evening goes on, uh, and that is an effort by the school to reduce the amount of paper uh, that is associated with this dinner. But you can't take them with you. They're not the prizes. And the flowers you can't take, because the flowers, the flowers are all going to be planted out on the campus grounds in anticipation of the graduation uh, in early June. So um, we make the most of everything here at UMass Boston. I just would like to mention the some of the, the uh, charitable support that made the evening possible. These are sort of the heavy hitters, if you will. Uh, we'll hold our applause to the end, but BWC Pharma Consulting, Johnson Controls, Mince Glevin and ML Strategies, NSTAR, Smith, Ruddock, and Hayes, Sodexo, the State Street, and the UMass Boston Alumni Association. And I love a great round of applause for all of those organizations. Just a couple of quick things. Uh, our musical uh, guest this evening 
They're still behind me. They have been playing their hearts out. They're a great group, the East Coast Soul Band. I want you to enjoy your salad and dinner while they will continue to play, and our program will begin afterwards. But before we um, start eating, I would like a nice round of applause for this terrific wait staff that is gonna be taking care of all of you tonight. So with that done, I think I've touched everything except the third rail. Thanks very much for being here, supporting these programs, and we'll be back in a few minutes with, uh, you're gonna have a great dinner, and we're gonna have a great program. Thanks so much for being here tonight. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one of the um, great honors that I get as the MC tonight is to introduce someone who really needs no introduction. Uh, everybody in this room, I know, knows what a great job our chancellor has done for the University of Massachusetts in Boston. Uh, I've been a fan of his for a long time, for even a time before he was chancellor, uh, as he knows. Uh, those of you who know Keith Motley know, you know, not only is a great leader of UMass Boston, uh, also a great athlete. Uh, grew up in the Pittsburgh area, played at Northeastern University. And we had lunch about a month ago, and uh, I knew that Keith was a Pittsburgh guy originally. And um, we were talking a little baseball, and he was talking about Willie Stargell and some of the great names of, in the Pirates' history. And uh, we, um, we were just having lunch, as we were with Joe Medeiros, as a matter of fact, in the, um, in the Chancellor's office. If you ever get a chance to have lunch with the Chancellor, it's a good thing, okay? If he invites you to lunch, it's a good thing. Nice lunch, dessert, the whole bit. Anyway. Um, one of the great heroes, and you know, I'm sure that Keith grew up as a Pirates fan and as a Penguins fan and um, you know, whoever, whatever teams are in Pittsburgh, he's a Boston fan now. Loves the Red Sox, loves the Patriots, loves the Celtics. Oh yeah, we've converted him. There's no, loves the Bruins, everybody. The Revolution, the Breakers, whatever you want, okay. Um, and of course the Beacons, ha always loves the Beacons. Anyway, probably the greatest baseball hero in the history of Pittsburgh, if you asked Keith Motley if any baseball fans in the audience would tell you Bill Mazeroski. The reason, anybody know who Bill Mazeroski is? Come on, come on, yeah. He hits a home run in the bottom of the ninth inning in 1960 to win the World Series for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Yeah, against the New York Yankees. And in Pittsburgh, at the old Forbes Field, it's like the greatest moment in Pittsburgh sports history. The only person who probably is a greater hero to the people of Pittsburgh than Bill Mas Mazeroski is the guy that threw him the pitch that hit the home run. And his name was Ralph Terry. He was a Yankee pitcher. And Ralph has been a friend of mine for about 50 years. So I'm sitting there at lunch with Keith Motley, the Chancellor of the University of Massachusetts, who I know is kind of still a closet, you know, Pirates fan, okay? Well, you know, even though he's gonna tell us something differently. My cell phone rings, and who is it but my buddy Ralph Terry calling me about a little business deal we're doing from Kansas, where he lives. And I put him on with Keith Motley. Now, Keith has never met Ralph Terry, but he knows all about him. Ralph Terry is like the easiest guy in the world to talk to. While we're having lunch, they have about a 10-minute phone conversation about the 1960 World Series. And uh, it, was a, it was a real thrill. It was just perfect timing to be able to introduce Keith Motley to the greatest hero in the history of Pittsburgh Pirates baseball, New York Yankee pitcher, Ralph Terry. Uh, and to watch him in that conversation uh, showed me not only uh, what a great sports fan this guy is. I mean, it wasn't one of these conversations like, hi, nice to meet you, here you go. It was, they're going on, they're going on. And it showed me also uh, what a, a breadth of, of knowledge and, and, uh, and, and universal uh, understanding, not only of academics, but of athletics. Uh, he really is, uh, in my opinion, the Renaissance man. I could not think of a better person uh, to lead this great University of Massachusetts at Boston. And it's my honor and my privilege to present to all of you a man who really needs no introduction at all, J. Keith Motley, our chancellor, our leader. Hey. <laughs> I had to tell that story. Oh, thank you, man. 
Dr. Dan Ray. He keeps forgetting that doctor part. Let's give him a round of applause every time we call on him. Every time we call on him, he answers that call. He said that I am um, a closet Pittsburgh fan. Well, all of my friends on this campus know that I have not kept that in the closet. <laughs> it's been hard for me to admit that I'm home here in Boston, but more and more and more every day, I feel that way because of all of you in this room. And so I'm going to do something I normally wouldn't do at one of these events. The Celtics are tied 23-23. <laughs> Because I know some of you have been sneaking out to the bathroom, going downstairs, looking at the, um, the video or the, uh, watching the television while we're here, getting the scores. And so I think it's, is it the first quarter? Oh, you mean they only have 23? I mean, they have 23 points in the second quarter. It's tied up and they're playing against Cleveland. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you for being here. Good evening, everyone. Someone said to me that I could have impacted climate change a whole lot by not speaking tonight because they said that my students have already spoken for me. Where are they at? Stand up, students, so you can see them again. Thank you all so much for being here, being host, making sure hosts and hostesses showing your posters, just making this an unbelievable night for us. I am so grateful for all that you do. I learned so much over the last two days with you. Thank you for educating me. They've given me more to talk about than I had. So yeah, they've impacted the climate change in this room. What a pleasure to welcome you to the University of Massachusetts, Boston for green education for the next generation. On behalf of the students, our faculty, our staff of Boston's great public university, I am just so honored to extend our gratitude to you, our event sponsors, and each and every one of you that took the time on such a magnificent day to be here. You could have been in the store with everybody else buying water. I heard it's gone. <laughs> Sorry. If we have a little leftover, we might share some with you as I pile it into my car. <laughs> but we're so grateful that you're here for this evening's benefit. I would like to begin by acknowledging the members of the honorary committee. We're grateful to all of you. Uh, your, your enthusiastic support resonated with all of us. And the support of this region's environmental se uh, sector leaders who are excited about this university's efforts um, and our initiatives to advance a clean energy economy is infectious. We are equally proud that those leaders include the University of Massachusetts Boston graduates like Mohammed Alam and the press president of the University of Massachusetts Boston Alumni Association, Jim Smith. I'd also like to acknowledge the current University of Massachusetts Boston Alumni Association President Bill Walzick, who is here with us tonight with his wonderful wife. This evening is also a special night to recognize alumni achievement, and I'm going to speak more about that in a moment. I um, also was able to snatch my two daughters away from the house tonight. They thought they were going to be watching Nickelodeon and all that other stuff at home, but we brought you in here to learn tonight, and we're so grateful for your presence. They're over there hiding because daddy's going to um, embarrass them along with their mom and my beautiful wife, Angela. I'm so glad that they're here. So tonight, this celebration has three themes. Educational opportunity, economic development, and environmental sustainability. 
as a public university charged with a mission to stand with the city, to serve and lead, the University of Massachusetts Boston has an inherent institutional responsibility to bring our resources to bear on issues of public concern. The challenge of global warming and protecting the integrity of the environment have tremendous far-reaching implications on the social and economic well-being of this region and the diverse communities. By leveraging our educational programming, our research, and community experience and engagement capacity, we are responding with bold action. And I hope you see that tonight. Climate change is the single most important challenge facing business this century. And the economic and business impact will be far-reaching and systemic, transforming entire industries and mobilizing the financial, technological, and organizational resources of business is crucial in accelerating society's response to climate change. The transition to a clean, low-carbon economy is an urgent need. It's, there is an urgent need to build a workforce with appropriate skills and knowledge. And I hope you saw that in the students that you engaged tonight. In keeping with our commitment to promoting economic development, the University of Massachusetts Boston is seizing the opportunity to lead the nation and the world in preparing students and returning professionals for careers in a low carbon world. We aim to train tomorrow's workforce and hone the leadership skills needed to develop innovative strategies beyond the transformation of business practice and beyond informing those policies. We want to do that here at this university. Launch this academic year, our new Center for Sustainable Enterprise in regional competitiveness in the College of Management is spearheading the development of this clean energy professional education curriculum. In addition, the center, for, the center is collaborating with international partners on critical research, addressing the intersection of business and climate change issues. The latest research will continue to inform learning and provi provide the green and white aspiring professionals with a cutting edge perspective for new thinking. We believe that the synergies needed to accelerate the development of an environmentally sustainable 21st century economy are found at the intersection of education, research, and the outreach to business, government, and NGOs. Thus, a third focus area of the center's work is to engage in the outreach with community partners to contribute to the local response strategies to impact climate change at the city and at the state level. As you know, proceeds from this evening's benefit and I say proceeds, that just brings a smile to my face. <laughs> Knowing that every table is full and that we can put this money to unbelievable use. This evening's proceeds will benefit the Center for Sustainable Enterprise and Regional Competitiveness. Its vision is driven by one of the talented members of this University of Massachusetts faculty. It's my pleasure to acknowledge the center's founding director and the chair of the Department of Management and Marketing, Professor David Levy. David. And while we're at it, his wonderful wife is here too. Stand up so we can see you.
Uh, where's, where's your wife? I see her over there hiding. Stand up. Thank you. He puts in countless hours here, so thank you so much for that. The launch of the new center coincides with the 35th anniversary of the College of Management. So I want to recognize my dean of the College of Management, Philip Quaieri, for his significant leadership in nurturing and integrating social, environmental, and ethical issues into the programming, into the curriculum of the college. Thank you, Phil, for all you're doing there. It's not an accident that the Princeton Review ranks our MBA programs among the best in the United States and that um, the Q, uh, QS rankings uh, rates us among the best in the world. This new center will certainly bring further distinction to the college's academic reputation. In addition to these initiatives, the University of Massachusetts Boston's response to climate change will also leverage the resources of other academic programs, research centers, and public service activities. While time does not allow me to talk about them tonight, you're going to hear about them. We have your address, email. We'll be out in front of your home. We're going to let you know. We will send more of those digital. You'll walk into an event, and it'll be the University of Massachusetts digital program on your table telling you about what we're doing here. The University of Massachusetts Boston is home to the nationally recognized, to nationally recognized research programs in environmental science. Our environment, earth, and ocean sciences department within our College of Science and Mathematics integrates the natural and social sciences to generate and apply knowledge about the quality of our environment and sustainable use of its resources. Building on this strength is an important focus for our Dean, Andrew Grozowski. Andrew, I know you were over to the left somewhere. Oh, to the right, to my right now, okay. The driving force behind many of the university's environmental science achievements is the man that we will honor later tonight. On this evening, when we focus on educational opportunity and environmental sustainability, it is most fitting that we also salute our most beloved colleague and distinguished alumnus, Professor Jack Looney. In the classroom, in the lab, and in so many kind of community involvements, he has contributed greatly to this institution, furthering the knowledge in the field and ultimately ensuring that our natural surroundings are protected from the harmful effects of human interventions. That's the last word on Professor Looney for now. They told me to say Jack, but I can't say Jack. I'm going to say Professor Looney, because this is a young man who I've known since I was about 15 years old, and I don't think I've ever called him Jack. <laughs> so Professor Looney, you'll just have to sit right there and bear with me. We're just building up to you, OK? So it's going to come a little later. Be patient. In closing, I'd also like to introduce our provost to you, Winston Langley who, as we think about all of this, all of this academic mission and vision, all of these years, these young men, Professor Looney, Dr. Langley, and others in this room, and women, have been working on this campus tirelessly to make sure that these issues are heard. So in closing, I would like to tell you about the scholarship fund that this evening's benefit supports. This scholarship supports graduates of the university's pre-collegiate programs who go on to study at the University of Massachusetts Boston. 
The award recognizes students with outstanding leadership potential, giving special consideration to those who have overcome challenges and persisted in pursuing their educational goal. It's a natural for me. Some want to know why do you continuously list that you were an upward bound student on your bio. bio. I say, why not? That is where I came from and I am proud to be an upward bounder. And so as we think about the next generation of great, edu edu as we think about this next generation of green education, let me just tell you about a group of University of Massachusetts, Boston, upward bound high school students who are precisely the type of individuals the Motley Scholarship support. Naming themselves the Get Fresh Crew, the group decided that it wanted to learn more about the environment. After several field trips, including one to Azure Dyn Dynamics, a manufacturer of hybrid vehicles, words like sustainability, low carbon, and renewable energy have become common in their language and in their vocabulary. Some are even now thinking about careers in green companies. What's more, the Get Fresh crew has joined with the community in Guatemala, which is building a new high school entirely out of recyclable products, recycled products. Next spring, your or my Get Fresh crew goes to Guatemala to help construct the school which will provide for the first time new secondary education for young people whose schooling currently ends in the sixth grade. That is noble work. Give them a round of applause. While our students are um, no doubt enthusiastic about their projects, and I think they should take the chancellor with them too, <laughs> they're even more passionate about the educational opportunities this new school will afford that community. They weren't thinking about themselves. They were thinking about how they could impact a community whose educational attainment stopped at the sixth grade. And so it gives you new perspective when you think about yourself as a young person here in this country and you lament the fact that, you know, this or that is not in front of you. And so they reach out. So in these pre-collegiate students, their ambition is that of the university students present tonight. The University of Massachusetts Boston cultivates the needs of new talent for a future filled with prosperity and sustainable enterprise. So thank you again for supporting the University of Massachusetts Boston. Your dollars work. Give them a round of applause. So I know you thought I was the keynote speaker. I took long enough. But now here we go. It's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker and a most distinguished alumna of the University of Massachusetts, Boston, who has worked on environmental issues at the local and state level in Massachusetts and Connecticut for more than 25 years. For nearly two decades, she served in senior environmental leadership posts under the administration of five Massachusetts governors. I even found out tonight on my way here, through my wife, that she also did some work in Stoughton, where we reside right now. So she's been around. But listen, I was in Washington, D.C. this week, and we had like Dorchester week down there. Jim Brett held the New England Council. And I have never felt <laughs> like I felt when people were coming up to me congratulating me on bringing home one of their own, who was OFD from Dorchester, to this campus. They were high-fiving me all night because you were coming to this event, many of whom are here tonight. And so there she honed her expertise in managing hazardous waste, pollution prevention, and smart growth planning. Prior to her current federal government appointment, 
She served as commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection. Last year, when President Obama was looking for a dynamic and results-oriented executive to develop and implement policies to affect climate change, the choice was obvious. No one could match the qualifications of this Dorchester native. No one could be the architect that she has been of things like Massachusetts' first climate production action plan to combat the effects of global warming and Connecticut's climate change action plan that brings significant knowledge, leadership skills, and an unwavering commitment to environmental sustainability, to federal government policy on these issues. She is, as Senator, Senator Christopher Dodd said, universally recognized as a uniquely talented environmental advocate. Ladies and gentlemen, it is truly an honor to present one of the University of Massachusetts Boston most esteemed graduates. Please join me in welcoming to this stage and back to this campus our alumna, Gina McCarthy. Let's give her a round of applause. I have a sneaking suspicion I might have to move the microphone down. That's why they bring me to Washington. Uh, Chancellor, thank you so much. It's uh, amazing to see his energy and enthusiasm. And as a graduate of this university, I couldn't be more proud to have a leader, a leader like you who has such a tremendous vision, but whose feet is squealy planted on the ground because uh, that is what this university is all about. It's to strive for excellence, but to understand that the way in which excellence happens is to bring people from where they are, to grab them in their own communities, and to enhance our communities on the way forward. And I think that's what has always appealed to me about this university. It has a sense of academia, but it doesn't lose its roots. And that is really where we, where we all are. I have. Uh, moved from Massachusetts, but frankly, I still live in Canton and go Canton. Stoughton's great, but we always fight. Uh, and uh, they, they primarily beat us in football. Uh, so as, as a result of that, I want to give you one word of advice and, and one factual evidence. The factual issue is Boston Bruins 5, Philadelphia Flyers 4. I'm sorry, I had to say that, because we lose constantly in the Canton-Stoughton matches. I have to win at something. Uh, we'll see how the series goes, Chancellor, but it's great to be here. And I want to thank the sponsors for, for tonight uh, for bringing us all together. Thank you, Dan Ray, for all of your support uh, for the university and for uh, Boston State, turned into uh, UMass Boston. I want to congratulate uh, Professor Looney on his, his great achievements and his award tonight. Um, I will tell you that I'm here for, for one reason only, and that is because I owe the University of Massachusetts Boston big time. Um, whenever anyone asks me, where did you go to school, I don't tell them Tufts. That was later. Where I went to school was UMass Boston. Not UMass, UMass Boston. And I let them know that I studied social anthropology with Barbara Ayers, who remains one of my idols. I studied primates with Naomi Bishop. Do you remember Ken, Naomi Bishop? When he had, Ken's my husband, he's here. Uh, it's very nice, he's, he's a graduate of 77. He remembers Naomi Bishop because as soon as he had to do a presentation in class, he skipped the rest of the classes. He hated doing that kind of stuff. Uh, but but uh, people ask me, why did social anthropology prepare you for the work that you're doing in government? Well, everyone who asked me that, I wondered whether they had ever been in the Massachusetts legislature, uh, whether they had ever been in the Connecticut legislature, and whether they had ever visited Congress recently, uh, because it is a primitive society into itself.
But frankly, uh, what, in, what social anthropology taught me and what this university taught me was to relish diversity. Not to fight it, not to worry about it, not to be concerned if people disagreed with what you said, but to try to understand what people were thinking, were feeling, where they came from, and to use that to understand how you could move forward. And that's what this university taught me. This university taught me that you don't need to think alike, that you don't need to be alike, that you all don't have to be rich to make a difference, that you could come from a, a, a pretty lower middle class Irish family uh, and you could work hard, and that's what it took to be in the United States of America and to succeed. Uh, this university gave me everything I needed to know about attitude. Uh, and that is what has taken me anywhere I've ever gone. So I thank UMass tremendously for that. UMass Boston. And it also gave me my husband, who is who was actually a graduate of 77. He likes to say he was a lot younger than I am because I'm a graduate of 76. The truth of the matter is, is he stayed back. A year. No, no, that's not true. <laughs> but right up the right up the way, uh, I used to every day go to the library where Ken was studying very, very hard every day, so I could wake him up and tell him it was time to go home. and where I actually have had the tremendous pleasure when I was in Massachusetts of working with some great people here in the university. And I'd like to recognize David Levy first. Because uh, David, his... <laughs> David, thank you. David worked uh, with me and with many of us as we worked on the development of a climate plan uh, in Massachusetts. Um, his opening of the Center for Sustainable Enterprise and Regional Competitiveness is just another example of how the university is expanding under the chancellor's leadership and under the wise guidance of David. So thank you very much for all of the work that you're doing. It's terrific. And also UMass is, is where my daughter Julie, who is right here, Julie, stand up, say hello to everybody, or don't. She never does what she's told, so that's all right. Oh, she stood. Julie is actually a third year nursing student here. Uh, and I will tell you, I couldn't be more proud of her. Um, I'll tell you something that she'll yell at me for doing so, but I'll tell her at you anyways. Uh, and that is that she started at Roger Williams in Rhode Island. Um, she started in September, and by December, she told me that she wanted to be a nursing student. Well, lo and behold, Roger Williams doesn't have a nursing program. So we very happily looked around, and she ended up going to the University of Massachusetts here in Boston. And I thank my lucky stars every day for that. Now, I will tell you that when I went to the university, uh, and when Ken went, I think it cost us 180 bucks a semester. It's a little bit more than that, but God damn, it's still worth every penny. So I, I owe this school big time, and I'm very, very, very proud, and I'm happy uh, to be back here to talk to you a little bit about what's going on in Washington, because I know there's a lot of concern for what's happening on the issues of climate change and energy. Um, but I first want to begin by just mentioning the Gulf Coast to you um, and tell you that, that people are facing a tremendous oil spill, as you know. Um, while this, this water situation here in Massachusetts may sound pretty extreme, uh, the, the uh, problems that they are facing are going to be quite large. And I couldn't begin by without mentioning that and mentioning that I just hope that the resilience of the people in Louisiana can stand one more natural disaster. Um, I know we are doing everything we can to try to help them, but it is uh, incredible to think that they have to be tested in this way one more time. Uh, but I also want to mention the fact that if you haven't read the Boston Globe today, you ought to just pick it up and turn to the editorial page, because it was an editorial today that talked about the tremendous irony of having this type of oil spill in the Gulf um, at the same time as last week, we couldn't even really move forward to, to put out a climate bill for debate in Congress. 
And it's hard to understand that. It's hard to understand the irony. But I will tell you, uh, at the end of my discussion today, tonight, um, I will mention to you that the University of Massachusetts helps me deal with that as well, because I've learned a lot. Um, but no one could argue, really, that even with the disaster uh, that is happening in Louisiana, uh, no one could argue that we have come an awful long way environmentally. Now, we can talk about how far we have to go, but once in a while, especially at a wonderful engagement like tonight, we ought to stop and congratulate ourselves on what we actually have achieved, especially since, was it last week? When was the 22nd? Just a little over a couple of weeks ago, we celebrated the 40th Earth Day. Now, that was pretty cool. I got to yell, play ball at a Red Sox game. Now, there's nothing cooler than that. I did it with a real gusto. What, should I do it again? Play ball! <laughs> Just a little instant replay for you. But we have made tremendous uh, progress, but we really need to think about what, we, what progress we have made and how that applies to the years coming forward. So let me just quickly talk to you about this a little bit, because it wasn't just the 40th anniversary of Earth Day, it was actually the 40th anniversary of EPA. EPA was created just after the first Earth Day, and it was actually the 40th anniversary of the Clean Air Act. So all I want to do is, for a moment, talk about the success we have had as a, as a result of those 40 years of experience under the Clean Air Act, so we can hopefully leave here tonight with hope for the next 40 years. And I will do that by beginning to say that in the 40 years since the 1970 Clean Air Act was enacted, we now have little widgets that many of you out there, like Professor Looney will know well, which are catalysts, scrubbers, low VOC paints and coatings, many, many technologies that in 1970 nobody ever heard of before. But were they afraid to pass the Clean Air Act? They passed the Clean Air Act as a leap of faith, knowing that people were dying as a result of air pollution, and they wanted to do something about it. What they wanted to do about it was to reduce those public health impacts, reduce those environmental impacts, and do it by triggering, by incentivizing the, the innovation that we all have inside of us that education teaches us, that academic institutions like this thrive on. They didn't wait to have the answers. They took that leap of faith. And as a result, just between 1970 and 1990, the Clean Air Act prevented 205,000 premature deaths, 18 million children's respiratory illnesses. And my favorite is 10.4 million lost IQ points in children. Now, you may ask me how I know that. I know that because that's the only way that explains why Julie is smarter than I am. <laughs> and it's because we took lead out of gasoline. Duh. Today's new cars, trucks, and engines are up to 95% cleaner than in past models. The most harmful ozone-depleting chemicals have been phased out of existence, leading to a decrease in dangerous skin cancers in the United States. The list goes on and on. But the most interesting part is, did the Clean Air Act take down the economy? As many businesses and industries actually predicted every time we put forth a new rule, and frankly, every time we continue to put forth a new rule. Well, it didn't. In fact, from 1990 to, through 2008, emissions of six common pollutants decreased 41%. At the same time, the domestic, gross domestic product grew 64%. By 2007, the environmental technology industry was up generating approximately $282 billion in revenue, producing $40 billion in exports, and supporting $1.6 million. 
We did not take down the economy because we made it a nicer, healthier place to live. We grew the economy for simply that reason. So we have to learn from that past 40 years, and we have to understand what we need to do for the next 40 years, because we are fighting a battle now that we simply cannot lose. And that is a battle of how we address the challenges associated with climate change. How do we not make the future worse, and how do we address the future that we know is coming today and tomorrow and the next day. How do we do that? We need the political will that we had 40 years ago. We need to make the same leap of faith. We need to understand that we can put together the right mix of economic policy regulatory incentives that can solve the issues moving forward and bring the power of innovation in the ingenuity of the human spirit to take an issue that is now a problem and turn it into an opportunity for this country. We owe our children nothing less than that. So first and foremost, we need comprehensive legislation. There is no question about that. I will tell you, every day I'm, I am in Massachusetts, I am proud to talk funny. They are wicked weird, I will tell you that right now. But I am proud to be from Massachusetts. I love listening to, to Senator Kerry. I love listening to Congressman Markey because they talk funny and they talk real. They tell it like it is and they make things happen. And I am so proud that we have them in office so they can push us to face the reality that one needs to face and to move forward with legislation that is absolutely essential. But I will tell you that I didn't go to Washington to sit around and wait for congressional action. Never done that before and don't plan to in the future. EPA's administrator, Lisa Jackson, didn't sit around so that she could look at the law and decide it was inconvenient to follow it. Or listen to the science and say, you know, that might get me into trouble, so I ain't going where the science tells me. What she actually said when she got there is that I'm going to listen to the law and I'm going where science is driving us. And that is why the EPA put forward, just last December, something we call the endangerment finding. Now, it doesn't sound that exciting, but I will tell you, 320,000 people felt the need to comment on it at the time. And since we passed it, 15 entities have decided that they want to sue us about it. So it must be pretty cool. Uh, it actually is a statement that the administrator made that said, you know, carbon dioxide and all these greenhouse gases actually do pose a danger to public health and welfare under the Clean Air Act, and lo and behold, we're required under law to regulate it. And that is indeed what we are going to do, whether, whether, whether Congress moves forward or we and whether it doesn't. And as a result of that, we moved forward swiftly. The first thing we did was meet President Obama's promise to have clean cars on the road. It is called the light duty vehicle. It is going to bring and move forward the next generation of clean cars. It is going to increase fuel economy up to 35.5 miles per gallon by 2016. And the most interesting th part about it is you're gonna save money. How death-defying is that? How dare the Environmental Protection Agency put out rules that are good for us? You are actually going to save about $3,000 in fuel savings over the life of the car, even considering any increased cost to make that car. And that is what is so intriguing about the challenge of greenhouse gases. Unlike the Clean Air Act, the challenge of greenhouse gases isn't about putting a widget at the end of a pipe that costs money to make and costs money to run. It's about efficiency. It's about making money. It's about saving money. 
So why is it that 40 years ago, we had the courage as a nation to move forward with the Clean Air Act that would challenge us so dramatically, and yet we can't take a step forward to do something that is good for us? We have to ask ourselves that. We have to begin to face those issues. And I would like to close by, by uh, just mentioning one additional thing, and I can't not mention it since I'm in the academic world, uh, standing here in front of my good university, and I want to challenge them to work on one of the reasons why I think we're not moving forward, and that has to do with education, education, education. I cannot tell you the number of people who come up to me and say, what difference does a degree make? Not a university degree, a temperature degree. Why do I care that we're going to be two degrees hotter on average than we were before? It's really nice that it'll be sunnier. You know, it's great. The, 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 the lack of understanding of the science is tremendous. And we owe it to our children to teach them the truth. I do not want to be arguing, I do not want to be arguing the science of climate the same way we are arguing still the evolutionary theory. We need to have scientists who talk clearly and succinctly in ways that people understand. We need universities like UMass Boston that serve real communities, real on-the-ground individuals, individuals that aren't going to want to run out and be the next president as much as they're going to want to go out and make a difference in their own communities. We're going to want to arm them with information that they can talk clearly about the challenges we're facing, why we're challenging it, why those challenges are arising, what opportunities they present to us as individuals, to our growth as an economy, to our growth in business, and we want to arm them with information so they can bring it back to the real people that vote every day and make a difference in a democracy. That's what this university can help us do. And I will end with a quote from my big boss, President Obama, who said that the nation that leads the clean energy economy will be the nation that leads the global economy. And as he campaigned for the presidency, he said, if not now, when? If not us, who? This university taught me that it's me and it's now. And we can arm our children to have the same attitude of energy, enthusiasm, promise, and vision that it's going to take to address the challenges that we're facing with climate and the challenges that we're facing with rebuilding our economy and understand that there are no choices that need to be made that separate those two. We can grow the economy, and we can address climate change, and we indeed must. Thank you very much. Now you see how we do it around here? Still fired up? Ready to do it, thank you. And we just wanted to give you a token. Harry's right over here. Of our appreciation and thank you so much for taking the time to be here at home. You're welcome back over and over and over again. Thank you for coming by and seeing us. And we're gonna make sure we take care of your daughter for you. No, Jeannie, you just can't be ambivalent on these issues. You know what I'm saying? You have to take a position.
What do we do with this? Got a bottle of water here. I haven't felt that good about Richard Nixon. It was when Richard Nixon was when the APA was founded. A lot of people don't realize that since, uh, since he resigned the presidency, as a matter of fact. Anyway, thank you very much, Gina, for those, uh, for those remarks. I, um, as I mentioned before, uh, didn't attend college on this campus, although I now feel very much a part of this campus. Uh, I attended college over on Huntington Avenue, uh, Boston State College, way back when. And there's a few of you here who also attended Boston State College. It used to be State Teachers College. I think actually at one point it was called the Normal School. I'm awfully glad it wasn't called the Abnormal School. But uh, it was, it was event. when I was there, it was Boston State College. And uh, we, again, we merged uh, with UMass Boston, uh, and a lot of professors at Boston State College brought their skills and their talent over here to the University of Massachusetts uh, around 1981. Now, there's probably no family, no family name, uh, and there were a lot of great f names, by the way, at Boston State College. And for those of you that don't remember some of those names, you know, Jim Leskatoff, the basketball coach, and Eddie Berry, the hockey coach, and Jim Nance, who was the wrestling coach, and Bill Squires, the track coach. A lot of great names uh, at that school. Gus Sullivan, the athletic director. Uh, but no name uh, was more uh, identified with Boston State College than the name of the Looney family. Uh, that is a, a, a name that is always going to be associated with Boston State College, and now associated with the University of Massachusetts of Boston. Uh, and as those of us from Boston State College and UMass Boston know so well, this evening's honoree, Professor Jack Looney, has touched so many lives. He even touched my life tonight. His wife was telling me that every night they go to sleep listening to Nightside. I'm not really sure how to take that, okay? Um, the fact that they're listening is nice. The fact that they go to sleep, though, I don't know. Maybe we got to perk the program up a little bit. Uh, we'll try our best. Anyway, Jack Looney, an educator, a researcher, a mentor, a civic leader, an environmental advocate. In the reflections of those who know him best, we see the measure of his contributions to public higher education and our Commonwealth, and of course, his amazing, engaging personality. Uh, he has retired from this teaching at this university as of last year, but like anyone with the last name Looney, uh, he's always going to be involved in the educational process somewhere uh, and is now uh, teaching over at Boston College. Uh, so uh, he's a step down a little bit from UMass Boston to go to BC, but he's still involved in what is arguably an academic institution. Nonetheless, nonetheless, we have uh, in anticipation of uh, Jack Looney uh, and uh, this award tonight uh, that is going to be a great uh, honor that Jack Looney will receive from our leader, Chancellor Motley. We have a video. It lasts about six minutes, so I guess we're going to dim the lights a little bit here, uh, maybe, uh, and uh, take a look at this video that will just uh, remind us all a little bit more about our honoree tonight, Professor Jack Looney. We talk about the University of Massachusetts Boston being a research university with a teaching soul. But you truly see what it means in action with a faculty member like Jack Looney. It started with his roots in public higher education as a student at Boston State. His unique blend of teaching and research and service to the community exemplifies the Boston State legacy of education for service. For 50 years, he has lived it and taught it as a student and as a faculty member. But most importantly, he made certain that these richly held values, the rigor of learning and educational access for all who desire it, became passionately embraced at UMass Boston. He continually inspires all of us to live up to these ideals.
Jack's legacy is the thousands and thousands and thousands of students that he's taught over the years. Uh, and this isn't just the material that he presents in class to them, but also he would make sure he would talk to them and help with their lifestyles, help with their direction of where they were going to go, what they're going to be doing when they finish uh, taking the courses. And his success, he always felt, was their success. So if the students were successful, he was successful. The phone would ring at 8 or 9, at 10 o'clock at night for a student, and my dad, if we were reading or working on my homework, would say, I need to take time to talk with this student, um, you know, back before email. He's taught us all to be hardworking and persistent, um, to respect the environment, to love the ocean. I was the only one of my friends who had an environmental dad, not only just when it comes to the ocean, but we had a compost pile before anybody knew what the word compost was. We had a garden. We grew all of our fruits and vegetables. Everything was recycled. We kept every plastic container. We reused bags, conserving electricity, making sure the lights were off, conserving water. We always <laughs> had to hang our laundry outside, even in cold weather. But again, it was better saving electricity and, and you know, better, better for the environment. My dad brought us up. I think from when I was born, saying it's better for the environment, it's better for your environment, it's better for your future. I think perhaps he ought to be <laughs> looked at as uh, someone who always thought that the links between uh, early childhood education, elementary education, secondary education, and what we today we call higher education are inseparable, they are intimate, they inform each other, and I think we could learn quite a bit from that. Between the crest and the trough is... Well, Jack Looney uh, is one of the people at UMass Boston who, ha who has exemplified a tremendous dedication to the teaching mission of the university, and really connecting students, not just with classroom, style of teaching, but with teaching in the field and in practical ways in every possible sense. Jack doesn't stop at creating an idea. He will go the extra step to implement the idea. Uh, first he says, you know, this is, UMass Boston is a wonderful institution. Its location is spectacular and incredible. We need to have a boat. He would do anything possible to get students in the field, on the water, in the Boston Harbor Islands, in any kind of facility that connects them to the practical side of what they were learning. He created a program that brought our students out onto the water um, with the academic rigor and discipline, um, but also the excitement of doing on-site research. We'd go out on boats with different groups or classes and students, and Jack would always come down the gangway and he'd have his bosun whistle around his neck and he'd be whistling himself on board uh, and announcing his arrival. I think Jack, above everything else, is social. And to be a special uh, 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 teacher, professor, one has to be social, interacting with everybody. Whenever you walk with him across campus, it wasn't a fast-paced walk. There was too many people. He knew everybody. Everybody stopped to talk to him. You couldn't walk by an office without someone saying something to him. I'm a teacher, and I started my teaching career in fourth grade. When I went into teaching, he told me that I would be affecting others' lives. And if I wasn't happy doing it, then I shouldn't be doing it. Um, because really what you bring to your job is so important in teaching. And I get that from him. I think everybody that knows him, students and faculty, know how much of a worker he is and how dedicated and committed he is. Jack Looney is an educator who understands what public education is all about. Wasn't that just great?
That was wonderful. You see, now that um, Professor Looney is officially retired from the university, it made it easy for us to arrange for his daughter Patty and baby Daniel to come on campus because you know he's nosy. It's hard to get anybody. If he was here, we could have never done that and got them here. I think um, it was a, a, a great secret, and we got away with it, and we're so grateful for that. It is now my pleasure to introduce, introduce a most admired faculty member, a founding chair of the Environmental Earth and Ocean Sciences Department, Professor Jack Looney. Jack, would you please join me here on the stage for the Chancellor's Medal presentation. Now, to our most esteemed colleague, Dr. Jack Looney, in recognition of your exemplary leadership in public higher education and on this occasion of green education for the next generation celebration, it is my honor to present you with the University of Massachusetts, Boston, 2010 Chancellor's Medal. I have something that we also want to give to you. Before I hand the mic to you, you know, I hate giving that up, yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to hand it to you in a minute. I have something else for you. You know, we um, want to give a gift to your grandson, Daniel, for his first trip to the University of Massachusetts, Boston, because we don't ever start, we stop we never stop recruiting, you know? Yeah. So we're starting to recruit him right now. And I know, is that some kind of violation, Charlie, in case he's going into athletics or something? But I have an admissions brochure, and I also have a onesie for him for when you are babysitting. You can read the admissions brochure to him over UMass, University of Massachusetts, Boston. Dangle it in front of him. Put on the onesie. Catch what's happening there, OK? And this is also for you. you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jack Looney. Wow. Uh, needless to say, I'm surprised. Patty, I'll get to you later. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, it's. It's really interesting. Uh, I have a, a just to, before I start, a word uh, for the Motley girls. Uh, ladies, I knew your dad about a little bit around your age, and I got to tell you, that man stuck with me. Uh, the memory of what he was like stuck with me for many years. So, uh, great role model, and I'm really, really happy. Uh, to be here and to be a part of UMass Boston. I also want to thank uh, Dan Ray for his kind comments. I want to thank Gina Capello, who I worked with um, a lot. And Gina, I'll talk to you about keeping your mouth shut, too. Um, and I'd like to uh, especially thank my wife, Maureen, uh, and two of my four children who are representing the family here tonight. Uh, They've all put up with me for a long while, through many years, and, and through an awful lot of activities. My brother Paul and his wife Carol are here. Tonight, they're representing uh, my family, my brothers and sisters, 
Uh, my mom is 101 years old. She's in a nursing home. And uh, Chancellor Motley, she's been here on campus too before she went to the nursing home. So we're, we're following that tradition pretty well. My wife's family and my family have had a long history of service, including elective and appointed public service and community uh, action. This spans state, local, and national activities. As a young boy growing up during World War II, I was introduced to the natural environment by my next door neighbors. Uh, Sunday afternoon walks were great, whether it was to the Fells or along the Mystic River. I carried that interest with me through my formal undergraduate and graduate courses. I focused on the geography, the geology, and yep, even the biology and ecology of our local environment here. I carried that interest through 10 years of public high school science teaching. So I guess you could say I, I practiced my craft in the trenches. I want to thank Terry Mortimer, who uh, gave me a shot <laughs> at putting some of these ideas of mine, uh, along with Melissa Roberts, who I think I probably aged, with some of the ideas. We camped out on the Boston Harbor Islands. We sailed tall ships along the northeastern coast uh, from New Jersey up to Nova Scotia. Never lost a boat, never lost a student, and that made Terry happy. <laughs> we also involved uh, public school students, uh, middle school students, high school students with uh, Liliana Mickle. Uh, we worked with uh, middle school and elementary school students, touring them here on the campus. We have beaches here, we have marshes here, and there's nothing like a marsh walk or a beach walk to uh, turn students on to this environment. I also want to thank uh, my dean, Andrew Gosofsky, and my successor chair, uh, uh, Robin Hannigan. And if you could for a minute, there are a lot of students that I know that came out of ECOS. You saw their uh, 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 work uh, outside uh, downstairs before you came in here. And if you would, I'd like my dean and my chair and all those students to stand up. If you could give them a good round of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much. I've tried to combine my knowledge of the environment and public education as cornerstones of service in the following ways. Uh, it's interesting, Gina, uh, under, foot, under a federal court order back in the 1960s, I designed and offered a science curriculum to the then Boston City Hospital School of Nursing. That school of nursing was the predecessor to the College of Nursing here at the University of Massachusetts. So uh, I know a little bit about that. I worked with a local health department doing the initial work which led to a civil action. And some of you perhaps have seen that movie. Over the time, I've done site plan reviews, orders of conditions. I've done variances and special permits on a board of appeal that I served for nine years on. I was a member of the Keystone Study Group which reported to Congress on environmentally friendly naval vessels for the 21st century. And as I mentioned to Gina earlier this evening, uh, we were able, through the use of scrubbers and uh, through the use of contemporary technology, to lessen air pollution from naval vessels. Every naval vessel larger than a frigate uh, can, control, can contain and control its waste stream on board. And by the way, uh, Gina, it's a hard act to follow. So I hope that uh, uh, I'm able to do as well as you did. Um, I served also for 30 years on the pesticide board, over 30 years. 
and we've lessened the use of pesticides in this commonwealth by about a third. We also introduced <laughs> We've also introduced integrated pest management, which says that you don't go out and spray chemicals unless you've developed a complete plan that says, hey, maybe we don't have to use chemicals. There are other ways to do this. This work would not have been possible without the support of many here tonight. I'm not always sure that we knew completely what we were into, but we did survive, whether it was EGS, EOS, CAS, CSM, union, faculty, council, all groups of which I participated in here. Uh, my good friend and uh, colleague that you saw in the video earlier, Provo Langley, uh, one time invited me to speak at a group. And uh, at the end of my talk, he presented me with what looked like a watch. And I said, uh, Winston, I said, I, I thank you. I said, but um, there's something funny about this watch. I said, there's, it's, there's a, a band and there's a case, but uh, nothing else. He said, well, he said, the next time you go on so long and speak so loud, we're going to give you the works. <laughs> so um, uh, I, I think that we're getting uh, towards the end. But before I do that, as I said in my earlier comments, uh, when Maureen and I were our first year, in our first year of marriage, we took on a, an assignment in a camp in New Hampshire. And I met a young man, first year away from home, 15 year old, who was at a uh, basketball clinic. And I'd watch him, uh, we put in 10, hours, 10 hour days then, and even after dinner he'd be out taking shots or uh, going from his left hand to his right hand, dribbling. And he often wondered what I knew about basketball. And uh, in all honesty, that much. But anyhow, we could fake it pretty well. Uh, Keith Motley, it's been a pleasure to know you as a young man, as a mature, energetic, educational administrator. I put something else in there. I didn't say mature. I said older. But my wife made me change it. Thank you. So anyhow. Because you uh, know it's you I love, right? A abs absolutely. <laughs> so since the Motley Scholarship began, I've been a supporter and participant. And it meets many of the goals and many of the aspirations that I had as a youngster coming up. And I know that Keith Motley had as a youngster. And so I say thank you to all of you. Thank you for making this a wonderful evening. And thank you, Chancellor Motley. Hey, Dr. Jack Looney. Hey, Dan, come on back up here. I'm stealing the mic from the MC. Isn't that something? Listen, on your table, Grossman has put together an unbelievable thing. This particular piece, it looks like a piece of paper. But I think if you read it, the small print tells you, if you take it home, you wet it, put it into some earth, it turns into flowers. Ooh, now you're going to take them. You know how you used to leave all that paper afterwards? I'm beating you to it. I'm going to be taking a couple of these for myself too. Take this home, plant it, and let's see who can grow the most beautiful garden. Before you close us out, I'm supposed to tell you that for those of you that still have some energy left, the band was just playing dinner music for you. We got dancing music coming up for about 45 minutes, and we have a set 
that some unbelievable singers are going to do. If you like all of the hits, they're going to play them. And I play in the dance, and if you want to stay around, you, you can come and dance with us too. Dan, come in. Come in. This, Dr. Dan, come in. <laughs> He's supposed to give you all this fancy closing yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. But what we've decided to do is cancel that because we want to do something for you. Oh, no, no. You never say no to us. You always say yes. We're so grateful. Don't go to sleep on this uh, radio show when you're listening to it, <laughs> loonies. <laughs> and also, bring those um, clothes out of the cold. At least don't put them out there when it's cold, man. <laughs> Okay, but we have something we want to give you, Dan, for um, being here always for us. It's a token of our appreciation. I want you to put it in that office, Thank and you very along much. with that degree, you know, <laughs> and just continue to do us proud. Thank you very We're much. We're just honored, man. Thank okay? you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I do get to close it out. Uh, we, we've had a great we have had a great night, but uh, it is only uh, 20 minutes after nine o'clock. Uh, so you're going to take your seed papers. We know that. I want to thank Jack Looney for saying the word frigate, because now I know that I can say the word frigate on the radio uh, and get away with it. Uh, and it's not one of those seven words that you can't say on the radio. Uh, <laughs> I, um, I want to, again, urge all of you to have fun, but drive carefully when you're going home, because I, I was told a story today that a state police officer pulled an um, older driver, there were a few older folks in the car, over on one of the major roadways, okay, uh, a six-lane uh, highway, six-lane highway, and uh, going, it's going 22 miles an hour. And uh, the, the, the state trooper pulled up behind them, pulled on the blue lights, came up and asked the older uh, driver, the lady, said, ma'am, what are you doing here? You know, we're at a major roadway. And you're going... 22 miles an hour. She said, oh, she says, I'm sorry, I thought that was the speed limit. So he said, no, ma'am, it's Route 22 that you're on, you know. It's not the speed limit. So as the trooper was about to, you know, give, let her off, he looked in the car and he saw all the other people in the car were just horrified, horrified. And he said to her, what's wrong with them? She says, I don't know, we just got off Route 127. <laughs> so... I want all of you to drive carefully tonight. We've, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We've had a great night uh, with our honorees, uh, with our food, with our wait staff. Again, if we get have a nice round of applause for the wait staff. And most importantly now, we have our entertainment provided by East Coast Soul. And so enjoy the rest of the evening and come back to this university many, many times because the University of Massachusetts at Boston is home to all of us. Thank you so much, everyone. And Chancellor, thank you. Unnecessary, but thank you.